summer salad. It looks kind of like a chef salad to me, but anyways, it's got some strawberries on there, uh, cucumbers, looks like some, uh, some ham, bacon, uh, there's an egg, cheese, lots of lettuce, of course, you know, and, uh, yeah, did I say chicken and cucumber, some peppers, anyways, I, I'm not sure what the dressing is, I think it might be ranch, anyways, or a creamy cucumber or something, but, uh, and I also have my, uh, I like this kombucha. This is the ginger lemon. I like this one. I've had it before. It's very good. So I got some shout outs. I got quite a few of them actually. Now, Alberta Hall. Alberta Hall has been right with me from pretty much the beginning. So a big shout out to Alberta Hall. Uh, Mo Slim 3. Uh, Corey Charles. Claudia Naren. Fly Guy Oli. Anthony Cruz, Brian C69, XAQ343, Rachel Worrell, uh, I think it's Beneva or Beneva, uh, double XS. So I, I hope I pronounced that right. I don't want to uh, dispronounce anyone's name, so forgive me if I do. And Al Cauldron Jr. Okay. So there's uh, some shout outs. Once again, when I do shout outs, uh, I don't mind doing them at all. Uh, just, you know, uh, just remember that sometimes uh, you may not get yours for a couple of weeks, okay, because I pre record my videos in advance. So, uh, you know, uh, it may not happen for 10 days or a couple of weeks or so, okay. So I'm going to uh, check out this uh, dressing here. I'm not quite sure what it is yet. It smells like a cre creamy cucumber or something. I won't put too much on to start with. There. So, oops. It's not ranch. Anyways, so I'm going to go with the salad here. or something, that was the place to go. A lot of rough people hung out there, a lot of bikers, a lot of all kinds of people. That, that was the, uh, the bar to go if you were looking for some action of some sort. You know, it was the type of bar that every time I went in there, I felt like I could, I could get beat up any minute, you know what I mean? I saw my first stripper in that bar. a pretty uh, bizarre scene sometimes. So I went in, bought a case of beer, and I decided to leave out the exit by the pool table. So I'm walking by the pool tables. There's somebody call my name. And I look over, and I recognize this guy named Bert that I knew in Saskatoon. Now I'd been on the island for two years at this point. So it kind of surprised me running into him. Well, I mean, 
California didn't attend a lot of people from, you know, Saskatoon or back east like to migrate to the island or to BC because it's milder climate and that sort of thing and way better scenery. So, you know, he's sitting there by the pool table, this he's smoking a cigarette. He's got his pool, his stick in his hand, his cue, waiting for the game to finish so he can start his game. So we get chat and he tells me that he's living out here now with his brother and his brother have a house they've rented. He said, come on by sometime. He gave me the address. And he said, right beside the Dairy Queen. So they're great to see you, Bird. No. When I met Bird back in Saskatoon, how I met him was I met him through a mutual friend named Bob. Not Bob. If you fall some of my videos, Bob is the guy who left the hash pipe in the back seat of my car, my parents' car. When I got my license and went to the drive, it's the same Bob. Anyways, ooh, I gotta make it a mess. So, make a bit. So anyway, how I met him was Bob's parents. his mother had remarried because him and his parents had split up years ago and his mother remarried and they moved to this small town called Melfort which I think is kind of east of Saskatoon I think small little town and that's where he met Bert because Bert lived there and then about a year later they decided to move back to Saskatoon so when Bert or when Bob moved back to Saskatoon he told Bert you know look me up so one day, Bert looks them up in Saskatoon. They start hanging out together. So one night, they're having a party at Bob's parents' house. And it gets raided by the cops. They had a fair bit of marijuana and that sort of thing. This is back in the day when marijuana was a serious offense. Simple possession can get you jail time, you know, depending on the circumstances. So... My friend Richard and I ran into Bob and he's telling me about this. And that's where we first met Bert, because Bert was at this party too. And they're both telling us that when the police raided the house, they actually came in through the kitchen window. And it reminded me of that song by the Beatles, she came in through the bathroom window. Well, this was the kitchen window, which is kind of funny. So anyways, they got busted and had to go to court and whatever. Not really sure what became of it, but don't think it was overly serious, but anyway, getting back to 1976, I'm in the bar, I've just ran into Bert, and you know, Bert, back when I met him in Saskatoon, he, was, he looked like he just stepped out of Woodstock, you know, you know, tie-dye, moccasins, and this kind of thing, and when I saw him this time, he had a long beard, he looked more like a, uh, why he always wore those those bib overalls. He looked kind of like a mountain man, and uh, you know, so he, his his look had changed a bit. But of course, he was still the same person. I recognized him right away. So he told me drop over sometime. So Bill and I leave. So of course, my weekend is over in a heartbeat. And I go back to camp. I think I'm mad. I'd like to see Bert. That'd really be cool. So, um, I couldn't remember the address, and I forgot he said by the Dairy Queen. If I would have remembered that part, it would have been easy. So, anyway. Is 
says, I'm in town with the CEO. I said, well, wow, what a coincidence. I said, you know who else is in town, Bert? And he goes, yeah, I know, I'm staying at Bert's house. Bert and his brother, Roy. So I thought, well, that's cool. So I hightailed over there. I rent right in this old house right beside the Dairy Queen. The guy who owns it is the same guy who owns the Dairy Queen. He has his house as an investment property. So anyway, I meet Bert's brother. Now Bert and Bob and I are all the same age, but Roy's a bit older. I think he's about 23 or 24. He's, he's the old man. was like Grand Central Station. It was like Party Central. Now, Bert was the type of guy who had no problem meeting people. He was very personable, very witty, very charming, funny, fun to be around, sarcastic, had a stinging wit at times. Really sarcastic, but funny. But you could make friends anywhere. And if you wanted to find him, he was always in the bar by the pool tables. And funny enough, I could never really figure Bert out. He was all the things I said. He was very smart, very witty, very clever. But he had no ambition whatsoever when it came to working. surfing I was staying there on my um, my time off from camp it was a five-day camp I had the weekend off so Friday night I would, I would arrive there I would sleep on the couch or whatever not easy to do because a lot of times I'd be people over there all the time now this house had three bedrooms Roy had the nicest bedroom facing the street with the mattress on the floor. Bert had a bedroom off the kitchen with the mattress on the floor. And there was a bedroom in the middle off the living room in between those two bedrooms. It was a much smaller bedroom. It had a window and all that with a mattress on the floor. But it was, um, I think it was really a den or a laundry room at one time. It was kind of like a, it looked like a bathroom, kind of oblong, very small for a bedroom, but it was used as a bedroom. Like I said, I was couch surfing there every weekend. Sometimes I'd sleep in that small bedroom. But other times somebody beat me to it because there's always people over there. Or there'd be a couple in there, you know. There was times there was so much partying going on I couldn't sleep, so I'd have to go sleep in my car. Not in the winter, of course, but 
they asked me if I wanted to uh, kind of move in more on a regular basis. And they promised me that small little bedroom. And I said, sure. You know, that way I was guaranteed a place to stay because I was couch surfing at other people's places. You know, here and there, like at Bill's place and Brian's place and other people's. And sometimes I got a motel and whatever. And Bert and Roy were my kind of people. So this would be perfect. Springsteen and I remember Bert had that uh, album Greetings from Asbury Park we just played that to death that and Born to Run now Bert turned me on to Rory Gallagher the guitar player I'd heard of Rory Gallagher but never actually heard him and Bert had a lot of his records probably every record he put out he was probably Rory Gallagher's biggest fan now Bert played guitar too he wasn't very good. Oh, he was no Rory Gallagher. His pride and joy was his um, Fender Stratocaster. He paid thirteen hundred dollars for it way back then, and he'd sit on the couch and he'd do scales, but he never seemed to advance at all. He strummed, but he never he never picked. He was definitely not a shredder by any chance. I mean. He just never seemed to improve for all the practicing he did. Now Roy, his brother, played drums. He had a nice set of Ludwig drums. And he seemed to be getting better all the time. And there'd be a lot of jam sessions going on. And now, Bert did not like paying bills.
I was sitting on my telephone. So this one day, this one day this guy comes over. He wasn't one of the regulars. He was kind of a straight-laced guy. He'd come over and he wanted to buy some pot off Bert because Bert sold pot on the side. I just got ready to leave and just before I leave he says, do you mind if I use your phone? Bert says, oh yeah, there's no problem. Goes in the kitchen. Underneath the sink, grabs that box, throws it down and says, help yourself. <laughs> it was so funny. I guess you had to be there, but the look on the guy's face was priceless. in my same situation as me. A young couple named Tom and Brenda. Tom was a wild man. Big red afro out here, big fuzzy red afro. Always, always gooned. Nice guy, but wow. He loved to party and get drunk and get high and whatever. And Brenda, they had a child too. Brenda was just the, you know, the, the meek little uh, housewife and just trying to keep it all together, you know, God bless that woman, I, I, I still, I'm still in touch with her on Facebook, now eventually, Tom and Brenda would split, and Brett and Brenda would get married, but that would be for years to come, keep in mind, this is, we're still in 76 here, thereabouts, so, Brett was living there, and he wasn't crazy, but he's kind of tired of all the partying because when you have to work, it's difficult. That being a cab driver, you had to work different shifts. You know, you know graveyards, and you had to pull all nighters, and it was tough. So he was kind of looking for a place to live. There was another guy living there. His name was Barry. Barry was a nice guy. First time I met him, he came over to Bert's house. I had my brand new Konica camera sitting on a tripod. Barry comes in with Brad. He's, you know, he's looking at my camera like this. And I said, uh, do you like photography? He goes, oh yeah. He says, I got a, I got a camera. I got an Olympus. Back then, Olympus, their claim to fame was they made very small cameras, very compact. We got talking about photography. Really hit it off. So it's pretty obvious that Brett, Barry, and myself had a fair bit in common. We were enjoyed each other's company. So one day. 
comes over and him and Barry are together and says, hey, Mark, let's go for coffee. So I said, okay. So it was my, I think it was Sunday, it was my last day, but we had to go into camp. I was going to camp that night. We're not coffee. I said, we are. We have an idea. Tell us what you think. And they're saying that getting our own place together. I thought, that sounds good because living at Bird's house was not easy. Like I said, it was party time all the time. I mean, it was nothing uncommon for the place to be rocking. Just as things quiet down, 1.30 in the morning or 2 o'clock, the bar is empty out, a cab pulls up, five or six people come in, and it starts all over again, music gets cranked up. I mean, there was just no, no end to it. I liked partying at Bird's house, but I was tired of living there. And he never had money. His, his unemployment check came and went. I remember for about three or four days on end, all he was eating was this uh, pancake mix, just supposed to add eggs and milk. He would just add water, that's what he had, was pancake mix and water, he'd cook it on his Coleman stove, and he, that's what he would eat. So, it was kind of weird. One of my lights just went out. So. That was kind of weird. So. That's how we lived. suggested we get our own place I was totally on board like I said I was going back to camp that day so they said we'll start looking I said that'd be great so anyways when I came back that Friday night later in the week they had a couple places lined up went and looked at them one was a basement suite but only two bedrooms which meant I would have been on the couch the whole time. Now, considering I don't want to be there two days out of the week, you know, four days out of the month, basically, I guess I could have done that, but I kind of wanted to have my own room. That was kind of a whole idea, or at least my own space. basement with a bedroom in the basement. Wow. So the next day, we contacted the realty company who was um, renting it out, the rental agency. And they said, no, if they had worded their ad differently, they would have said preferred married working couple or something, but they didn't. They just said house for rent, basically. Now we encountered that before. I remember the three of us were looking at a house. Started walking up the driveway. The guy just practically chases us out of the yard. You know, he didn't want to rent to three young guys. So we really wanted this house. We thought that was discrimination. So we consulted a legal aid lawyer. She told us that there 
was definitely discrimination. So armed with that information and the fact that we had consulted some legal counsel, we went back to real the rational agency and told them straight out that's discrimination. So they let us they, they, they let us rent out the house. We were just ecstatic. We really gave ourselves a pat on the back. Because we were very proud of ourselves that we'd stood up for our rights. Now the house was an older house, of course, it had a, a nice fireplace. Brett had the, fed, the bedroom face on the street, Barry had the one face in the backyard. I had the bedroom in the basement, and it was a huge bedroom, really big. The kitchen had wraparound glass, like the old glass, you know. It had um, the morning sun, the afternoon sun. It was always bright in their beautiful, bright kitchen. Loved it. Older home, but nice. It was great living there, so. $245 a month, that was about 80 some dollars each. Three of us moved in. It was so nice to have our own place. We had people over and that sort of thing, but it was never the party house that Bert's house was or Tom and Brenda's house was. Nowhere near. That's funny. All three of us drove pickup trucks and we were all to photography because Brett he wanted to get in on the action because Barry had a camera, I had a camera. So he bought himself this beautiful Canon camera. He should have got himself something more entry level, but this thing was beautiful, really complicated, top of the line. I forget, it was the, it was a very popular Canon. I can't remember the model, but it was like the, the real top of the line one for that time. It had all kinds of accessories. It was what somebody bought. This one time, I wish I got a picture of it. He was, he had had a few drinks and a couple of joints, and he had his camera on a tripod, and he's trying to figure it out. He's got, his, he's looking at it like this. It was like he's trying to diffuse a bomb. That would have made a great picture. You know, this guy sitting there trying to figure out this really complicated camera. It was just it was so funny. Wow. I still like going to Bert's house to, to party. They'd have jam sessions and it was fun, so it was nice to go there and not have to worry about living there. I'd just take a cab over or drive over, take a cab back, whatever. Sometimes just walk, it wasn't that far. Um, now there was a guy named Lester. Lester was... Um, the most laid-back person I've ever met in my whole life. Really funny, really sweet, very nice. Love to drink. Every other word was the F word, which is kind of funny. But a very, very nice guy. Never saw him lose his temper.
so Roy and him were really at each other's odds, like or, uh, uh, at each other's um, throats. And Roy, I thought Roy was getting ready um, to kill him. Still can't remember what the fight was about. I'm not sure if they could either, but they were both already drunk. So Roy was sitting on one couch, and Lester just sit beside me on the other couch. And I'm pretty wasted myself, so I'm just sitting there kind of, you know, taking it all in. Kind of hoping they'll calm down, but not really concerned about it, because it's, it's not the first time I've seen, you know, this type of thing somewhere, right? So Roy said something. Unless just said something back, and that just, it really triggered something. Roy went over there and just started beating on him, just pummeling him, just, just pummeling him with his fist, right? And Les just laid down like this. Roy goes and sits back down, Lester gets up, and he goes, Thanks, I needed that. <laughs> he just had to get the last word in. So, this is where it gets a bit scary. Roy goes in the bedroom, comes up about a minute later, has got this 410 shotgun. so fast. So the next day I go back. Everybody's all sobered up. Roy's not there. Don't know where he is. Um, and I think, well, and Bert was there with his girlfriend, a few other people. And I walk in. And Bert says, holy shit, did, did you see what happened last night? Or not? No, he, he said, did you see that hole in the ceiling? I said, yeah, I know, I was here. He said, you were here. I said, oh, yeah, I saw the whole thing happen. He said, well, what happened? So I told him. I said, that's why my car is out there. So I came back to get my car. And the, the gun is in the car. I took it away from him. So Bert thanked me for that. But uh, he said, well, maybe, maybe Roy's sick or something. I said, no, I think it was just a severe case of too much alcohol. That was actually Bert's gun. I told Bert, I said, maybe you should uh, keep that somewhere else or get rid of it. So, they had seen the hole in the ceiling. And uh, I think somebody, maybe Lester, had said that Roy had fired the gun, but he was so... He'd been so drunk he couldn't remember all the details. So I was able to fill him in on everything. So that was a very weird scenario. Now getting back to Brett and Barry. Brett said he had a mutual friend who had just moved up from the States a couple years earlier, living with his mom. 
he was an only child and he really wanted to, to move in because he'd been coming over um, during the week when I wasn't there and he really liked the place so he said he's coming over this weekend he said uh, you, you'll get to meet him so he comes over and it turns out I know him his name is Chris I said Chris how you doing we had met in high school his parents were living down the state. His mom was actually Canadian, but his dad was an American. He was born in the United States. So there, his dad had a, um, a fairly prestigious job with some aerospace um, company or something. And so he stayed down there, and Chris stayed with him. He was, like I said, an only child. But the, they separated, so the mom moved back up here. And she had a new guy. Chris came up here to live with her. I'm not really sure why, but he, he, that's what he wanted to do. So when I met him in high school, a couple years earlier, I'd, I'd, I'd gotten to know him and gotten to, to know his story pretty much. And thought Chris's mom was pretty an um, interesting character. She was kind of heavy. Not obese, but kind of heavy. Always wore those moo-moos. Lots of eye makeup, you know. Her hair was like a volcano, horn rim glasses, and lots of uh, bangles and bracelets, and tur a lot of turquoise. Really into astrology, and she could always see her aura and all this. I found out later she drank a lot too. And she would do kind of funny things, like one time, a few, this would be like a few years later, I was there with my girlfriend and, and Chris and a few other people. And she cooked this, this lovely meal and for dessert. She had the fruit cocktail. And after eating the fruit cocktail, we could see this little bits of something in there that looked like dough or something. And my girlfriend, she said, what's this cakey stuff, you know? And Chris's mom said, well, I was going through the, I was going through the freezer and I found an old pie crust, a frozen pie crust. So I broke up into bits and threw the fruit cocktail. Well, it wasn't the end of the world, but it wasn't very appetizing. She was kind of funny that way. But she was a nice lady, always very nice to me. But very possessive of Chris. Very possessive. She survived when he was down in the States, is beyond me. Must have killed her. So when he moved in with us, she was phoning all the time. Her and her um, husband were coming over all the time. They'd find an excuse to take Chris out for dinner or whatever. I mean, Chris at this point was like, you know, 20 years old. So, kind of a weird situation, but we used to tease him about really bug him a lot, at, you know, about his mom. Because she would phone all the time. Listen to a lot of Studio Dan. 
that album Asia. I can't listen to that album Asia by Steely Dan without thinking of those days in that house. I can't drink Kahlua where I don't flash back because Kahlua was what I was drinking a lot of back then. So a lot of good memories. So we lived in that house for about a year. So he drove down to Bellingham and signed up. So clearly he was moving out. The rest of us were going to move out. Barry and I decided to get an apartment together, two bedroom apartment. I can't remember where Brett went. Can't remember. Maybe back with Tom and Brett. I'm not sure. I can't remember. No, no sooner joins the army and he meets this girl. Falls head over heels for her. Within a matter of a few weeks, maybe a month at the most, they're engaged. So, he's already committed himself to joining the army, so next thing you know, he's down in the States, he gets sent to, I think it was Denver, He was really missing his, his fiance and not worried that she might leave. So she decided to put his mind at ease and she moved down there with him. They'd eventually get married and stay married for a number of years, but like a lot of us, they split up too. I'm still in touch with both of them. States in the army. Barry and I are now 
check an apartment. Chris gets his mom to come to the rescue. She goes to her doctor. This is unbelievable. She tells her doctor that she wants him to write a note saying that her health is failing and she needs to have her son back home to care for her. She has her, uh, her, uh, her priest or her minister or whoever do the same thing. And I'm not sure how they did it, but Chris was actually discharged from the army. I, I, it walks my mind to the stake because I always thought that once you joined, you know, you were there for your duration, you know. I didn't think you could get out that easy. But you got out. And I back, moved back here to the island. We hung out a lot together. Had a lot of fun. Chris became a photojournalist. or whatever and they were not renting an apartment Barry and I shared that apartment for about a year and it didn't take long before it turned into the same type of place that Tom and Brenda had or that Bert and Roy had same type of thing now just around that time said, you know what, I want to move back to Saskatoon, I just, I can't handle living with Bert, he said, you know, Bert's my brother, I love him, but I just can't live with him, so he was going to move back to Saskatoon, Bert was begging him not to, sitting there talking and he's supposed to catch his bus at 5.30 or something and I hear this announcement come over you know final boarding call or something I said Roy isn't that your bus and he looks at me like yeah he goes running out there and the bus is pulling away so he's running along beside it banging on the uh, the side but it just keeps going and he missed his bus back home. We walk in the door and Bert almost drops. He, he thinks that Roy's changed his mind. He's, oh man, I'm so glad you came back. And then of course his uh, joy uh, quickly dissipated when he found out that Roy had only missed his bus and he, had, he still had every intention of leaving. Now Bert saw this as an omen, like a sign that he should stay. I said, come on, Roy, stay. You were never meant to leave or whatever. But Roy had to go. So the next day, I drove him down, deja vu, put him on the bus. He was gone. He would return to the island, but not for... Oh, for about another 14 years later, maybe. By this time, he'd be married with a kid. back to Saskatoon in 1980 and saw Roy. Looked the same. Good to see him. Eventually I got a girlfriend in the late 70s and I had to get out of that place.
place that Barry and I were sharing. Because, you know, Tom and Brenda were over there all the time, and Tom was always raising hell, and his nephew Tim was there. Tim was a great guy, but they're all, all cut from the same cloth, constantly partying. And I thought, well, this is our place, man. I don't want to be here. And this one night, it was really quiet, and there was just me and Tim there. And Tim didn't even live there. I don't know where Barry was, but Tim was couch surfing. He was sleeping on the couch. And the son of bangs on the door at about one in the morning. He said, there's a fire, there's a fire. So we get up. I throw my pants, that's all I have on. Run downstairs, and there was a fire in the laundry room. Not sure what happened, but it was an accident or what. But kind of uh, added some excitement to the evening. Like I said, I've actually got my own place. Barry moved out. Not sure where he went. And then um, I had this girlfriend, so eventually her and I moved in together. Lived together for a while. And then I took the, uh, the cook training course. Chef training course. Started that in 81. By this time, I completely shifted gears. I was no longer seeing a lot of these people. Bert came over once in a while. We're renting this big house. Me and all these fellow chefs, students. And he came over one night and I still went over this place the odd time. I remember one time I was driving by his house and I saw a big ramp out in front of his, like going down his front steps. I thought maybe there was somebody living there who was disabled or something. So I thought, stop in, see how he's doing. I knock on the door. And I'm just about to see what's with this ramp. And I notice he's got a Marty Davidson parked in his living room. He always told me he wanted to be in a bike gang. So he bought this Marty Davidson. And he really wanted to uh, be a biker. You know, he was, uh, he was no longer hanging out with a lot of the people he did before. He was uh, hanging out with all these bikers and all these wannabes. And the Hells Angels had a, a clubhouse not too far away. He was down there a lot. I think he was hoping to join, but somehow I couldn't see that. I don't know what the criteria is for joining a bike gang like that, but I don't think Bert would have been accepted. I don't, just can't see it. I would think you need to have more than just Harley Davidson. But when I was taking the chef's training, he came over one night. We were partying all night. The next morning, he wanted to give me a ride. We're going to go back to his place. He had some pot back there. Now the sun is just coming up, so it's probably about maybe 4.30, not quite 5. The sun's just coming up. We got on his bike. No helmets, I'm on the back, he's on the front. I've got a jug of wine. He, we both have these red bandanas tied around our heads. I don't know why, but we did. We started driving. He's going up on the curb and on the sidewalk and has to stop and turn and just... You know, my friends, I do not condone drinking and driving. I really don't. But I was young and foolish like a lot of people. stupid stuff I'm not proud of. But um, we made it back to his place. Barry was from Prince Edward Island. He eventually moved back to Prince Edward Island around the early 80s. The last time I saw him was in a restaurant and I was taking that course. The chef training course shortly after that. He wasn't there very long and he was in a motorcycle accident. He became paralyzed from the waist down. Passed away a few years later from a lot of medications and just complications from, you know, the accident. And he was on a lot of painkillers and, and just different things. And it was just very unfortunate, a very unfortunate chain of events. The last time I saw Bert, just before my son was born, in 1985, I had a recording studio in my basement. I was recording a local band. And um, to be 
beautiful summer day in July. Bird came over. Can't remember why. And then um, he left. That was the last time I ever saw him. I found out later. He was selling a lot of coke and doing a lot of coke. And he ended up owing the Hells Angels a whole bunch of money for coke that he snorted himself or something. And the only solution he came up with was to move out of town. And that's, that's kind of what Bert was. I mean, if his roof was leaking, he wouldn't fix it. He'd just put a bucket down there, you know. He wouldn't deal with things. He would get himself in these stupid predicaments and that's how you deal with things. So Roy, who was back in Saskatoon, was now married with a kid. And Roy's wife drove out, picked Bert up, took what belongings he had, you know, all his Rory Gallagher records and whatever. Drove him back to Saskatoon where he stayed for a number of years. Now, I would think if you owe a bike gang a lot of money, uh, you probably wouldn't be safe anywhere. Back to the island. This one time, I was still married in my old house, probably about 20 some years ago. Maybe about 10 or 15 years after he moved away, I got a phone call from him. He's living in a neighboring town. He's back on the island, living in a neighboring town, and he's just pissed on the phone. Understand what you're saying. So I was happy to end the conversation. Never heard from him again until 2009 when my friend Richard was, was dying from cancer and Bert phoned me up. Absolutely shit faced. Could barely understand what he was saying. That was the last time I heard from him. Passed away in the fall of 2019 from liver cancer. I've had a mutual friend at the mall and she told me that. I was, I was heartbroken. Because we just started to reconnect. We reconnected a couple of times. And this cancer came on rather aggressively and it didn't take long before he passed away. He eventually ended up marrying Brenda, you know, Tom and Brenda, he married Brenda. And what remaining years he had left was, they were very happy together. They had a much happier relationship than Brenda had with Tom. Roy moved out here with his wife and kid for a few years. Unfortunately, they split up and he moved back. Saskatoon, and that was too bad, um, but anyways, yeah, that's, that's pretty good, Chris, Chris is still doing good, he's, works for the local newspaper, photojournalist, he, he should retire by now, he's my age, you know, but maybe he enjoys what he's doing, but anyways, that's my story, my friends, I hope you enjoyed it, uh, always nice to hear your comments, I, I love hearing what you think, how you feel, and I love when you share ideas with me. So you take care, look after yourself, look after each other, and uh, we'll see you next time, okay? Bye-bye now.